What's up guys, my name is Nick and welcome to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna show you guys step-by-step -step how to invest in the stock market. This is a beginner course and everything in this video is free. And I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know to start investing in the stock market today with confidence. So guys, grab a pen, get a piece of paper and let's get this thing started. So first off guys, I have to do this. It sucks, but this is a warning. Beware of spam comments asking you guys for money. First of all, I do not have a WhatsApp and I do not have a manager unless you count my girlfriend. But what you guys can do is smash the like button, subscribe if you wanna see more investing con content and comment below. I'll reply to all of your comments, guys. All right, so here's what you'll learn today. What is the stock market? What exactly are stocks and do they make people money? The types of stocks, the easiest way to open a brokerage account, the account types, timing the market. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We'll find out. The best way to do stock research, your key terms, the two ways to make money, and dealing with taxes when you're investing, beginner tax strategies to reduce your taxes, value versus momentum investing, Warren Buffett's principles for investing, you know, how long should you hold on to a stock, the importance of investing early, how much money should you invest, your due diligence, this is doing your own research, and more. All right, so let's get started, guys. So first of all, my background as an investor, I started investing around eight years ago with a 401k used to have a minimum wage job at a car wash. And with that 401k, I did not make any money. In fact, I lost money for years and years and years. And it wasn't until about a little over two years ago that I got serious with investing. I started doing the, my own research, like I said, due diligence. And I started with M1 Finance. And so guys, I do want to point out that I have a six month emergency fund. That is the most important thing when you invest because it keeps you from wasting your investments, from selling your investments. So always have at least a three-month emergency fund. I went a little bit over, but that's just because I like a little more security. Then I also have a 401k at my job where I invest just in the S&P 500. And then I also use my M1 finance account to buy individual dividend growth stocks. I'm also a big believer in learning the fundamentals of investing, and I'm a huge proponent of investing as a way to build wealth for anyone. The great thing about investing, and especially the way I do it with dividend growth stocks, is anybody can do it. There's no barrier to entry. All it takes is like five minutes to set up an account. And then here's my account value. All right, so why should you invest as soon as possible? So it's the potential to make money. The average return of the S&P 500 right here has been about 7% since the 1800s. And guys, th while this isn't guaranteed, long-term investing is safer, even if it's not 100% safe. So guys, as you can see in this chart, the S&P 500, you know, it just keeps going up and up and up. I know this last year, it grew about like 27%. 26, 27. Last year it was in the 20s. I think even in uh, 2019, 2018, it was in the double digits. So we'll go over the S&P 500 a little bit more later on, but I just want to point that out that the S&P 500 is one of the safest things you can invest in. <clears throat> and now you want to invest to let your money work for you. And this is something known as compound interest. And we'll go over that later. And also passive income. That is what I love about investing and about dividend growth stocks is just the passive income. I'll let you guys know ahead of time. In December, I had a record-breaking month for dividends, $179 and something cents. I don't know, but guys, that's a good amount of money to be earning in dividends. So next, we're going to hedge against inflation. So normally, inflation is 2 to 3% per year or higher, and I put the higher because this past year, 2021, 
inflation was insane. I, I don't even know, six, 7%, maybe more. And the reason you wanna hedge against inflation because your money loses value over time. So let's say inflation this past year was 7%. That means if you had $100 on January 1st of 2021, by December 31st of 2021, that $100 is now worth $93. So this is why we need to invest and you need your money to make money for it to grow faster than inflation. And you know, you can compare this to your savings account, <clears throat> which I know my bank gives like 0.1% interest. It is awful. But guys, there are other things you can invest in like stocks, real estate, and plenty of other assets that generate money. So retirement is the number one reason to invest. And this is what millennials are saying. 64% invest, 64% invest for retirement, 56% invest to live more comfortably, 53% invest to feel more financially secure, and 44% are for maximizing their wealth. Now, despite this, 46% say they aren't saving enough. It's the number one activity they say they need to do more of, and 39% expect to be forced to work by time beyond retirement age. And guys, 12% don't contribute to any retirement fund at all. And guys, that is scary to me. I could not imagine that. Even just putting 2% of your income is better than nothing. All right, so what is the stock market? It is a marketplace where buyers and sellers trade shares in companies. And it's regulated by the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission for the United States. And then you have publicly traded companies where owners dilute their personal equity in exchange for capital. Now guys, an IPO is an initial public offering. It's where an investment bank underwrites the IPO, buying up the shares, it's where they take the risk, and then they sell those shares on the market for a fee or a percent of the share price. And there are 13 different exchanges in the US. You've got the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and many more. And the stock market allows individual investors like you and me to buy and sell in a regulated environment, also similar to an auction. So the definition of a stock, it is a piece of a company. Your share of ownership in a corporation a, is a type of currency that is backed by the company. Units of stock are called shares and corporations issue stock to raise funds to operate their business. <clears throat> and guys, I know this picture sucks, but just imagine that this is company A and they have a hundred shares and you down here own three shares out of the 100. So you own 3% of the company, which is a pretty decent amount, I would say. All right, next up guys are the types of stocks. You have common stock, which is ownership in a company and you get the right to vote. I know with my stocks, every once in a while, I'll get an email asking me to join a meeting so that I can vote. And most of us are gonna own common stock. And another thing is common stocks also have dividends, which are something I love, and they're variable and they're not always guaranteed. You know, as we saw during March of 2020, a lot of companies cut their dividends and I actually sent those companies packing. I, I did not like those. So next up, we have preferred stock. You have no voting rights, but you have a more stable dividend and you get paid out first in case of a bankruptcy. And then it's harder to lose or gain value with preferred stock. Next, you can categorize, categorize stock by small, mid and large cap. Now, small cap is gonna be about $2 billion. Mid cap is gonna be about two to 10 billion and large cap companies are gonna be 10 billion plus. And then guys, you also wanna look at the sectors of stock. <clears throat> For example, tech, energy, consumer. And the reason I show you this is because you wanna di diversify your portfolio. You don't wanna have like 50% or even 80 or 100% of your portfolio in just one stock or even just one sector. Even though tech is doing great, you wanna even that out among many, at least five sectors. So next we have growth stocks versus value stocks <clears throat> and then ETFs, which track indexes, 
like the S&P 500 index or at low expense ratios or like mutual funds, which are usually run by you know people and they have a higher expense ratio. I think you're always better off going with the ETF. <clears throat> Next guys, we have our risk tolerance. As you can see, cash is the safest thing you can hold even, you know, even with inflation being so high. Now bonds, they're gonna be a little bit, a little bit riskier, but still very safe. Next, you have index funds. Like I've mentioned, the, the S&P 500, these are gonna be relatively safe. You could also invest in the index fund, the total stock market, which is VTSAX. So next we have stocks, which get into the riskier category. Stocks can be risky. They can also be a little bit safer if you buy blue chip stocks. But when you're looking at, you know, small cap companies, then the future companies that are innovators and disruptors, that is where you can see the potential to where stocks can be a lot riskier. <clears throat> now, guys, this is the point. Real estate, I think real estate is one of the best assets you can own. And that's because, you know, they're not making any more real estate. But at the same time, real estate is very risky. If you don't look at the numbers, you don't pick a good location or you pay too much, like we've seen how much housing prices have gone up and just all land in general. <clears throat> and then finally, guys, you have crypto, which is one of the riskiest assets, if not the riskiest. Maybe I should have put NFTs, but guys, crypto, at least the, the random cryptos out there are very risky. If you are gonna get crypto, I think Bitcoin, maybe even I would say Ethereum is what I would look at as being this probably the safer one of cryptos. So next up guys, I just wanted to show you guys this slide of the Vanguard S&P 500. Ticker symbol is VOO. And as you can see, you know, it just keeps going up and up and up. But of course, the stocks don't always go up. Sometimes they come down. But with the S&P 500, it is investing in the top 500 companies in the United States. And let's say one of those companies goes bankrupt. All right, the S&P 500 will take that one out and they'll bring in the next stock. And this is what I believe makes the S&P 500 so secure is because they're always updating which stocks they have that are going to bring you the best return. So next up, guys, we have the type of brokerage accounts. You have a taxable account, which is your standard account. You pay any taxes on gains that are realized. And if you haven't sold a stock, of course, you won't pay any taxes. Now, if you earn dividends, there is the potential to pay taxes, but we'll go over uh, capital gains taxes a little bit later. Next, in your taxable account, you have stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, and there are cash versus margin accounts. And guys, I would say just stick to cash. Don't do margin because that is risky. And if you get margin called, you can lose a lot more money than you had in your account. And with taxable accounts, the thing I like about them is that there's no limits to uh, how much money you can invest or how much money you can withdraw, and even what age you have to be to withdraw your money. Now, with the retirement accounts, they are tax advantage. Like, for example, the Roth IRA, you pay your taxes on your money, then you invest in the Roth IRA, and when you pull it out, when you're about 59 and a half years old, or later when you retire, you don't pay taxes on any of those gains. But like I said earlier, the limit is that you have to reach 59 and a half and you can only contribute $6,000 a year into the Roth IRA. Next up, we have traditional IRA, the SEP and the 401k, which one thing I like about the 401k is that you invest your money into the 401k and it reduces your taxes. So like you can, if you invest 10% of your income into the 401k, when you do your taxes, your income is 10% less. And so that's awesome. Once again, it does have a contribution limit. And when you do take out your 401k, you do take, you do pay taxes. 
And But the good thing about the retirement accounts, they reduce the amount of taxes that you have to pay. Like I said, there are withdrawal rules. And there are many other accounts that you guys can look into, like the HSA, the 529 savings plan, the custodial brokerage accounts, and robo-advisors. So that's opening up a standard brokerage account. This allows you to buy and sell stocks. So some examples of brokerages are M1 Finance, Webull, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity. You can do Vanguard. Of course, there's Robinhood. There's a lot of brokerage accounts. And I like the app accounts just because they they were free. Uh, what I love about M1 Finance is it gives you fractional shares. They were one of the first ones to do it. And the nice thing about fractional shares is even if a stock is like, you think it's too expensive to buy a full share, you can buy a piece of a great stock. And that's, that's what I love doing with M1 Finance. <clears throat> so now for beginners, I'd recommend an app-based brokerage. Wow, I just said that, huh? Free stocks and or money for opening an account. Oh yeah, and guys, right now M1 Finance is doing a special. You'll get $50 if you sign up. You can use the link below. And with Webull, they're giving away two free stocks if you sign up. And now there's no minimum account balances or fees, and they're easy to open. You just have to be 18 plus. If you're younger, I would get with your parents about setting up that account. All right, so the application process. So it's creating your account with one of these app brokerages is insanely easy. Of course, once again, you guys can use the link in the description to set up an account and get your free stocks and money. That would help me out and it will help you out. You know, we're getting the money from Webull, M1 Finance, Robinhood. We're taking their money. Might as well sign up. So guys, you submit an application and then usually that takes a few minutes. Sometimes it could take hours. But then once you get approved, you'd put your personal information, social security number, address, name, date of birth, et cetera. Then you set up your username and your password. You verify your identity. And then, guys, I would put in two-factor two -factor authentication just to give yourself that extra security. And then you wait for your application to be approved. And then you do the little penny thing in your bank account when you set it up. And then after like five, seven days, you can fund your account. And then guys, you can start investing. So yeah, so let's do a walkthrough of M1 Finance. All right, what's up guys? So let's do a walkthrough of M1 Finance. This is the main brokerage that I use. And this is the majority of my wealth right here, 43,650.97 cents is in M1 Finance. I do also have a, like I said, my emergency fund and my 401k. But right here, these stocks, this is the majority of it. As you guys can see, I have a cash balance of $51.68 that I will be investing next week. And also my gain right here, it says 7,819. And um, that isn't the real gain. M1 Finance does something called, uh, well, it says a combination of all market capital gains and dividends earned. It's usually a money-weighted return. My true market gain is what it says right there, 5,913. But even that's kind of wrong. And I'll show you, it should, be, it should be higher. It should be in the 7,000. But one of my stocks, FRT, recently did a merger. And so they sold all of my shares and I guess they're gonna buy them back on the third when we trade on Monday. But guys, what I really care about on this screen is right here, my earned dividends, $1,900. And I started investing on September 17th. <clears throat> That's when I cashed out my 401k at my other job. I took a minor tax hit and I threw all of the money into M1 Finance. And so guys, I can actually show you some of the stocks I own. As you can see, real estate is right here, 25%. The trifecta, which I can actually click in that. The trifecta, I own Q Yield, Jeppy, and Nusi. That is my income fund or income pie. 
And then we have real estate. I've got good stag, which is an amazing stock. Oh, realty, another one that is great. And LTC, Blackstone, like I said, FRT, they're doing a merger. So it sold all of my shares and they're going to buy them back. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> Next up, I'll just give you a rundown of all my stocks. And I'll actually show you one more thing. The one day, as you see, guys, I did not lose $1,500 in one day. That's once again, that's FRT. And so let's go through. You know, you can see my stocks right here, the 4.2. That's the actual percentage of my portfolio. And the bolded is what I set M1 Finance to, what I set that stock to be in on M1 Finance. So as you can see, guys, I have my healthcare, Pfizer, Avvi, Energy, Southern Duke. I have Verizon, Telecom. <clears throat> I have Altria Group. Some people call that a SIN stock. You know, I've got my tech stocks like Microsoft, ADP, Apple, IBM. I have like my grocery stock, consumer stock like Costco, which again, is one of my favorite stocks. It's an amazing stock. American Water Works, Home Depot, which had like a 50% gain over the, over last year. Ooh, Texas Instruments, another good one. Johnson & Johnson, Walmart. You guys, one of the things I love about owning Walmart and uh, Costco is that a lot of my stocks can actually be bought in Walmart and Costco. Like you can find Clorox, Colgate, Hormel, Kellogg's, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, General Mills. You can find Apple, Microsoft, 3M, Pepsi, you know, pretty sure Pfizer. You can find pretty much all of these stocks in Costco or all of their products in Costco. You can find their products in Walmart. And then you might use MasterCard, you know, if you have MasterCard to buy your products when you shop at Walmart or Costco. And there was one other one that I saw. I uh, just slipped my tongue. Of Oh yeah, ADP. Costco and Walmart, they probably use ADP for their payroll. So that's one thing I love about my portfolio is just the synergy of all my stocks. The majority of my stocks have great synergy. They work together. But another thing I want to show you guys is the activity page. So this is where you can see dividends I earned, like LTC, 7.68. Gladstone, good, 21.73. Devo and guys, I'll uh, in a later slide, I'll tell you a little more information about Devo. And then here's what I was telling you stock merger FRT. So I had some two buys and a sell, and I'll actually click on that so you can see it. So I ended up selling Devo and I bought more Nusi and more Jeppy. And you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on as far as dividends, you know, buying stocks. Every Monday, as you can see right here, 125, 125. Every Monday, I deposit $125 into my portfolio. And right now, I'm using it to buy Jeppy, Nusi, and Q Yield. And where's one where I can show an example? Yeah, right here. Bought some shares. Next up, you can see like my holdings where we can categorize them by, huh, doesn't seem like it wants to let me show my unrealized gain, but maybe that's because it's the start of a new year. We can go over funding history. We can see how much money I've deposited every year. And as you can see, I haven't withdrawn anything because I'm investing for the long term, 10, 20 years. I'll worry about withdrawing out of my portfolio in the in a few decades next you know you have research where you can look at you know stocks or news stocks kind of funds i also have my pies you know like how to invest your first 1k i have the first 10 stocks i ever bought and let's check that out 
So as you can see, a lot of these stocks aren't in here anymore, like AT&T, Coca-Cola, McDonald's. Not all of them survived. And I've got reasons for why I sold them. Let's see, one more thing. Oh, like I said, the dividends, 1900 since September 17th. That is the number that I care about. The market gain, you know, that's nice too, but I love the dividends. And let's actually, we can view those. And as you can see, out of all those dividends I've earned, 736 is from real estate, 144 from the trifecta, the income pie. You just scroll down, you can see all the stocks I've earned dividends from over the years. MasterCard, even though they increase their dividends a lot, it is a very low dividend yield. And they didn't have a good year this year, but I'm hopeful for them for the next decade. And all right, guys, so that is M1 Finance walkthrough. If you guys like the app or the brokerage, you can you know click the link in the description. And like I said, when you sign up, fund your account, I think put like $100 in, they'll give you $50 for free that you can use to start investing. And in fact, while we're here, one last thing. You guys could start off by investing in the S&P 500. And if we look at the one year, 28.79%, that is an incredible return. And let's see if we can find the expense ratio right here, 0.03%. That is very cheap, a lot cheaper than doing in person where they're gonna charge you probably 1%. All right, so let's get back to the slides. <clears throat> so guys, let's talk about the types of trades. So first up, we have a market order. And this is where you buy or sell at the best available price in the current market. It's the fastest way to buy and sell a stock. And it's the most basic type of buy and sell. <clears throat> and you just buy at the current asking price or sell bid price. So next up is a limit order. It's where you buy or sell at a specific price and it's you choose that price. So the order only executes if the stock hits that price. So let's say for example, you set a limit order to buy a stock at $15. And let's say that stock is at $16. So you're hoping that that stock goes from 16 to 15 and that's the number that you chose where the stock is valuable for you. And only when it hits 15 is when you're gonna buy it with a limit order. So let's see another example. You set a sell order. You set a sell order to limit at $20. So let's say you have a stock at $19 or $18 and you wanna sell it at 20. If it hits that number, it'll sell. <clears throat> and now you have a stop order or a stop loss, and it's where you buy or sell when the price moves past a specified price. And that's very good to save yourself in a crash. So next up, guys, let's talk about how to research stocks. Important metrics to understand, such as price, the cost to purchase one share of the company, and guys, this needs a little context, which we'll go over. So for example, the 52 week low and high, you know, just because a stock has a high price, you might wanna look at the, you wanna look at the 52 week low and high because that could actually be, you know, the mid range, it could be worth more. And then you guys, you have the trading volume, which is a quantity of shares traded during a given period and the market capitalization, which is the total market value. And then you have the beta, which is the stock's volatility in relation to the overall market. And normally if the beta is over one, it's more volatile. <clears throat> and then last we have the PE ratio, which is the price per share or the annual earnings per share. So PE ratios, it's the future growth baked into the price 
We see P, we see some PE ratios right now up to $1,000 or more. I would not buy those stocks. And guys, the valuation is much higher than their earnings. If you have a PE ratio that's less than 20, it means it's a de decent PE ratio. <clears throat> but guys, you could have some stocks and you know I might even show you a stock later that has a higher PE ratio than 20 and it's a stock that I would buy, like hands down. For example, I'm sure Apple and Costco have really high PE ratios. Those are two stocks that I would buy because I know that they're going to perform, that they're going to do well, especially Costco. That stock seems to never go down. I would not wait for a dip on Costco. I would just buy into that. So value slash earnings equals the PE. And let's get an example over here. <clears throat> so company A has $100,000 in earning, and they have a value of a million dollars. So you would take that one million and you divide it by 100,000 to get a 10 PE ratio for company A. Company B has 200,000 in earnings and $1.5 million in value. So you would take 1.5 million, divide it by 200,000, and that would equal 7.5 PE ratio. So that would be a better value, company B would be a better value to buy. So next, once again, continuing on stock research, peg ratio. This is the price to earnings to growth ratio. It's the PE ratio divided by growth rate of its earnings for a time period. It helps you value a stock while factoring its expected earnings growth. It is standardized. It's a standardized way of comparing companies with different growth projections. Lower is better. If you have an under one, the company could be undervalued. And if you have over one, it's potentially an overvalued company. So here's an example of a peg ratio. Company A has a price of $10. Their earnings per share this year is $1. Their EPS one year ago was 69 cents. So PE is 10. Earnings growth rate is 1 divided by 0.69 minus 1, which equals 0.449 or 44.9%. Then you take the PE ratio and you divide it by the earnings growth rate of uh, 10 divided by 44.9 and you get a 0.22. Now this is very low. This means that this stock could be insanely undervalued, um, but it could also be really risky. So you have, there's a, it's a fine balance when you're choosing a stock. And next more about research, dividend yield. It's how much a company pays out in dividends each year compared to its stock price. Now, what I would say with dividend yields, you guys want to be careful with the very high yields. For example, like AT&T, they've always had a high yield and now they're going to be cutting their yield by anywhere from 40 to 50%. So I would say, you know, if you have a yield from less than 1%, you know, that's really low. I have a few stocks that are less than 1% such as like Microsoft, Apple, uh, MasterCard. That's a really low dividend. Oh, Costco is another one that has a low dividend. However, all four of these stocks have high dividend growth rates. So for example, I think it was Costco that increased their dividend by over 12% last year, which if they keep doing that, It'll be seven, eight, maybe nine years. Costco's dividend will double. Another one, Microsoft, they increased it by 9.8%, which is amazing. So you also want to understand the context of a dividend. Yeah, 1% is low, but if they have a growth rate that's 7% or more and it's sustainable, that might be a company that you want to invest in. I would say 2 to 3% in the dividend yield is safe. That's about where you want to see. Once you start getting to 4% and higher is where it gets riskier. All right. And I do have some stocks that have 4%, but I try to keep them at a low percent allocation of my portfolio. So next you have your annual dividends per share divided by the share price to get the yield. And it's expressed as a percentage. 
Next up is your price to book ratio. It's the stock price divided by the book value per share. It tells us the market valuation of a company, usually higher versus its book value. Book value is found from net assets of a company. It's assets minus debt equals book value. Under one is good, over one is overvalued. So profit margin, the profit per dollar of revenue expresses a percentage. A 20% profit margin means each $1 of sales results in a net income of 20%, oh, 20 cents, <clears throat> which a 20% profit margin is great. Now return on equity, is ROE, it's a return on your net assets. It measures the financial performance of the company. It's the net income divided by the shareholder's equity and 15% and up is considered good, but it depends on the sector. Next up, we have our current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. It measures the short-term liquidity of a company. Now, I like to see it above one because that means they have more assets than liabilities and you don't wanna be drowning in debt. A good example of companies that are drowning in debt are usually the telecom companies like AT&T and Verizon. They usually have a lot higher debt. Other companies like Microsoft and Apple have a ton of cash and a lot more assets and very little debt. <clears throat> and so, Another reason we want to see it above one is does the company have enough cash to pay off their debts in the short term should they need to. Next guys, I'm going to walk you through a stock and I chose Microsoft. It's, I would say Microsoft is my favorite stock. I love that company. But guys, before I get into all this data about Microsoft, like looking at the numbers is great when you're valuing a stock, but I also like to look at the qualitative approach. <clears throat> so for example, when you think of Microsoft stock, you know, what do you think of? So I'll give you like from my personal life, when I was in college, we would use Microsoft Office, PowerPoint, Excel, Microsoft Teams, you know, when I was working at different jobs, we would use Microsoft Excel, Word, PowerPoint, sometimes Outlook. And then even in my personal life, I use, you know, Word, I use all the Microsoft suite. And then, so that's three examples of just using Microsoft at school, at work, at home. So what I like to think about is, well, if I'm using it, like say, for example, if I'm using it at school and there's 30 to 40,000 people at my college, then who's to say that most other colleges in the country, the United States, or maybe even in the world are using Microsoft. And if I'm getting it free through college, I mean, someone's paying for it. Well, I'm probably, probably paying for it with tuition, but the college is spending a lot of money that Microsoft is making. Same thing with different jobs I've had. Those jobs are paying Microsoft a license fee to use the office suite. <clears throat> now let's look at another angle, Xbox Live or Xbox, which I used to play a lot of video games back in the day. I love playing Xbox Live, Halo 3, Call of Duty. And so that's you know a completely separate industry that Microsoft dominates and they're doing very well in the gaming industry. And then another one, which I would say the cloud computing, Microsoft has their Azure. And I remember when I first started looking at Microsoft and their cloud computing, Amazon actually had like 51% of the market share and Microsoft was number two and they had 13%. Now, a few months ago, I saw the data again Microsoft was at about like 31, 32% and Amazon was like 32, 33%. So Microsoft is growing their cloud computing business, which is one of the highlights I would say about Microsoft. So guys, I'm just giving you like three qualitative examples 
of why I think Microsoft is a great buy. But now guys, let's go into the numbers. So first up, do we have our share price? Which yeah, Microsoft is expensive. If you want greatness, you gotta pay for it. $336.32, that's a lot. But that's another thing, another reason why I like fractional shares is because even if I can't buy the full share, I can still own a fraction of an amazing company. Size so next, let's look at the 52 week range down here. And as you can see that Microsoft started, or Microsoft's lowest point was 211 and 94 cents. Their highest was 349.67. So they're not actually that far off from their highest point of the year in the 52 week period. So once again, like I said, Microsoft, <clears throat> definitely expensive, but also an amazing company. And I would say it would probably be one of my best performing companies of this decade. Next up, volume. You have a 17.9 million volume, average volume 25.7 million. The market cap is 2.5 trillion. Now the beta is 0.87. That means it's less than one. It means Microsoft is not a volatile company for trading. And I don't know if it'll actually show us the year to date, but in Microsoft rose about 50 something percent this last year, which is insane growth. And, you know, I don't think Microsoft is in a bubble. I'm gonna continue to buy that stock. So next up, we have our P.E. ratio, 37.62. So yeah, based on that number, you'd say it's overvalued. But then let's look at the EPS. So it's 8.94. For every one share you own of Microsoft, you're getting almost $9 back, which I'd say is a great deal. Man, Microsoft should sponsor me, right? So forward dividend, forward dividend and yield, Microsoft currently pays $2.48 per share. And like I said, it has a very low dividend yield of 0.74%. However, they just increased it by 9.8%, which is a incredible dividend growth rate. I'd say anything over seven is incredible. But, you know, if you can get, get to 10 or more, that's like really crazy. So, right, so next, let's look at the price movement of Microsoft. So you can see it had a quite a big dip around the middle of the year or towards the mid range, yeah, mid range of the year, but it started to come back. And then news. Let's see the statistics. So once again, market cap. Price to book ratio. It's trying to look for their, there's a peg ratio. So once again, their peg ratio is really high. So you might say that's overvalued. Let's see, profit, profitability. Profit margin, 38.51%. That's amazing. I love that profit margin. Let's see, the return on equity is 49%, which is also a great number. Now we see the revenue. 176 billion gross profit. <clears throat> Whereas, oh yeah, right here, total cash, 130 billion and total debt, 78.9. So they have more cash than they have debt. As you can see that current ratio, 2.16, which I'm also liking that. And there's one more, the payout ratio right here. 25% payout ratio. That means for every $1 Microsoft earns, <clears throat> they're giving us 25 cents back. That is a very healthy payout ratio. So now that's how you can look at, how, that's how you can you know, research a stock and through the numbers to evaluate it. But once again, guys, I would say, don't just focus on the numbers when you're researching a stock. Also look at, how you use it in your daily life. 
And one more example, I'll get something Kevin Hart said in a podcast, which I thought was incredible. He was teaching his young son about investing. And he said, so do you like Starbucks? And his son's like, yeah. He's like, do you think other people like Starbucks? And his son's like, yeah. He's like, so is that an investment? And he's like, yeah, I think it's an investment. And I actually have a Starbucks Starbucks on my watch list. It's a stock that I'm going to do some more research on and consider buying in the future. I know I just drove past a Starbucks this past, this past week. It was slammed like always. So, you know, maybe that's a, that's not a, that's not a number. That's not like a quantitative value, but just always seeing Starbucks slammed every day in the morning, the afternoon, it might be an investment, it might be something you want to buy. So now let's talk about timing the market. Should you time the market? Short answer, no. <clears throat> but let's go into it. The definition of timing the market is trying to predict when the stock market goes up or down and using those predictions to influence your buying and selling pattern. Historically, it has been better to buy after a crash than to try and time a market high. Stocks tend to recover. Must be a good company that will survive a crash or economic downturn. And it's better to buy after a large crap crash or dip. It is crap when a stock crashes or falls, just to be honest. And uh, don't sell during small dips. That's called panic selling. Or as my shirt says, recession selling. So guys, focus on the long term. Hold on to good companies as long as you can. And holding longer makes investing safer. And I would say it only makes it safer if you buy great companies. So, or index funds. So the safe answer always is timing the market is bad. Time in the market is a lot better. <clears throat> so going back to timing the market, should you do it? And I would say no, because you have to be right twice. You have to know when a stock is at its lowest so you can buy it. And you have to know when it's at its highest for when you can sell it. And I mean, if you know how to do that, we, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be watching a beginner video. But always, you know, just continue to invest money every week, every month. It's all about consistency when it comes to investing. <clears throat> you know, with my 401k, it, it was all in the S&P 500. It went up over 27%. That was just dollar, co dollar cost averaging, investing every week when I got my paycheck. And, you know, it still grew that much. So, yeah, dollar cost average. Gradually invest into a company over time instead of all of all at once. It's a great tool for new investors who want to limit their risk exposure if a crash occurs. Historically, since the market generally moves up, it should technically be better to buy at once. However, in volatile markets, dollar cost averaging can be a great strategy. So appreciation versus dividends. There's a lot of controversy controversy with with this but it just depends on what your risk tolerance is how you want to invest it's your money guys that's why it's called personal finance so appreciation it's a rise in share price due to company performance market sentiment and or hype you sell higher than you bought to see a capital gain but <clears throat> you lose your shares and it's not guaranteed. Next are dividends. They're usually paid out quarterly. They have recurring income. You can reinvest it or pull it out. And it's paid from company profits. Now, can I buy right before the X dividend date? If you guys remember back when I was showing you my M1 finance portfolio, my activity feed, I bought Devo on the 27th. Or maybe I bought them on the 26th. They had their ex dividend date on the 27th. I sold them about the either the 29th or the 30th. <clears throat> you can go back and check. And as you saw, I received a dividend from Devo. I had no clue that I actually bought them right before the ex dividend date. I thought I bought them afterwards. 
but I still got the dividend, which is nice. And I think I may have gotten a small gain from it. But now uh, many of companies appreciate and they pay out a dividend. So tax implications of investing. What happens when you sell a stock? You will be taxed when you sell a stock for more than what you paid. This is a capital gain. Consider taxes when determining when to sell. A long-term capital gains is where you sell after holding longer than a year. <clears throat> so long-term long capital gains, that can affect your tax implications or your tax liability, whether you held a stock 364 days or 366 days. I'd recommend just hold it longer than a year and then you'll only pay anywhere from 0, 15 to 20% taxes, depending on your income level. And if you're like a multimillionaire or billionaire, there's an extra like three point something percent tax that they pay. Next are your short-term capital gains. It's when you sell before holding one year and it's just taxes your ordinary income. And in general, holding for over a year will result in less taxes. And your brokerage should send you a tax document each year with your capital gains and losses. And usually if you have TurboTax, you can just plug it right in, which is nice. <clears throat> All right, long-term capital gains. So in, for 2022, if you are single or married filing separately, if you earn income up to $41,675, It'll be 0%, 41,675 to 459,750, 15%, over 459, 750, 20%. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say in 2022, you don't earn any money except for $41,675 in dividends or 41,675 in a capital gains from the sale of a qualified stock, you would pay the government zero dollars in taxes, and that is incredible. Now, if you're married, <clears throat> filing jointly, it'd be you know, those numbers 83, 350, 517, 200, and head of household, and so on. Next up. We have short-term capital gains or ordinary income tax for 2022. Now, guys, this is a progressive tax scale. So even let's say, see this range, 89 to 170. Let's say you make $100,000. You won't pay 24% in taxes. You will pay 10% of up to 10275 You'll pay 12% from 10,276 to 41. And then out of this range, if you make 100K, you will only pay 24% on the money from 100,000 minus the $89,075. So just keep this in mind when you're looking at what your tax liability will be for selling a stock <clears throat> or earning dividends. So now let's look at a retirement account that help you save big on taxes. Everyone should take advantage of tax advantage retirement accounts. Like I told you guys, I have a 401k. And let's just look at Roth IRA. If you're eligible, you pay your taxes now and you avoid taxes on your gains. And then you can pull out your gains in retirement, which is minimum 59.5 years old. Then you compare this to a normal taxable account where you are taxed twice. So you're taxed on the money that you earned from your job, and then you're taxed when you sell a share or earn a dividend. But with the Roth IRA, you can only contribute up to $6,000 per year. <clears throat> and then other retirement accounts, there are other retirement accounts that you can research yourself. And Roth IRAs, they're not the only option. There's also 401ks, traditional IRAs, and more. All right, tax loss harvesting. 
It is a strategy to offset capital gains. Definition is you share sell shares at a loss to offset a capital gains tax liability, usually at the end of the year. So you sell stocks that you lost money on. It creates a loss to offset any gains in that year. Then you can replace it with a similar asset. However, there is a rule, the wash sale rule. You cannot repurchase a stock for 30 days if you claimed a loss for tax purposes. <clears throat> so here's a tax loss harvesting example. You've owned stock A for 69 days and want to sell it. Your total gains so far are 100K. This results in a 100,000 short-term capital gains. And let's say you're taxed at 30%. Now I know, like I told you earlier, if you earned $100,000, you wouldn't be taxed 30%, but it makes the example easier. So $30,000 in taxes, you know, not including any state taxes or local taxes, and let's say you've owned stock B for 120 days and you can sell it and you can sell it at a loss and your total loss will be $50,000. <clears> now you take that 100K minus the 50K and you have $50,000 in short-term capital gains, which ends up being $15,000 in taxes. So you also saved $15,000 in taxes. Now, the same applies for long-term capital gains, but you must match, and both can be used. And it, this is great for realizing tax savings when you want to sell an asset for profit. Now, when I look at this, like, yep, yeah, tax loss harvesting, that's great, but, you know, I would just buy a stock that doesn't lose $50,000. You know, I would do some better research. That, that's my two cents. <clears throat> All right, now let's look at value versus momentum investing. And Warren Buffett, who's one of the most prolific investors, and he's actually one of the reasons I got into dividend investing. And these are his principles for investing. The leaders are important. You want to have a strong CEO and board of directors when you're investing in a stock. And you want to invest with facts, not emotions. That's like, guys, I know there was a lot of hype this past year with a ton of stocks. Try to stay out of the emotions and choose stocks and companies that, you know, have great numbers, like I said, that have great qualitative factors going for them and invest for the long term <clears throat> and don't sell unless the business changes fundamentally in a bad way. So, for example... I used to own AT&T stock. One of the things I liked about AT&T besides the dividend was HBO Max. But not only is AT&T like cutting their dividend, but they're also getting rid of HBO Max, which is a fundamental change. So that's why I sold that business. And for 95% of people, an index fund is your best bet. Warren Buffett actually recommends the S&P 500 index fund. And the S&P 500 normally outperforms the top investors. I'm saying these guys are Harvard, Yale, Stanford. These guys are insanely smart stockbrokers. S&P 500 over a 10-year period beats these guys 86% of the time. Like, for example, the S&P 500 beat Kathy Wood this year. Now, yeah, she had a great year last year, but if we look over a 10-year period, it's an 86% chance that the S&P 500 is going to beat most of the experts. And then buy what you know. <clears throat> that goes back to my Microsoft example, my Starbucks example. You know, what I was talking to you guys about synergy with stocks you know how the majority of my stocks you can buy them in costco you can buy them in walmart so then guys when you see a great opportunity take it so <clears throat> another example like microsoft yeah it's really expensive if you look at the price today it's expensive it might be overvalued 
But if you look at a 10 year time period or a 20 year time horizon, I think Microsoft's dirt cheap. And I would say the same for stocks like Costco and Apple. So guys, remember when you see something great, you gotta grab it, you gotta take it. All right, value investors, they use, a, they use fundamental analysis they look for undervalued companies compared to intrinsic value. They buy undervalued and hold long-term or until the company becomes overvalued. Now, momentum slash growth investors, they look into future potential of a company. PE ratio, price to book ratio don't matter as much. Their investments tend to be riskier and more volatile. They tend to get emerging industries. And they don't care about debt as much and it can lead to higher growth. You should combine these strategies to smooth out your long-term performance. All right, so the importance of investing earlier. Let's say Jack invests $200 per month starting at age 25, and he only contributed $96,000. As you can see, that's now worth over 500 grand. Whereas Jill started at age 35 investing 200, she contributed 72,000 and now she has about 250K. Then Joey started 10 years later at 45, contributing 200. He contributed 48,000, but he's barely got over 100K. So as you can see with Joey put in half the money as Jack, yet Jack increased his wealth by you know, five times, whereas Joey only did double. So as you want to start investing as young as possible, so you can get that compound growth, that compound interest, and just have your investments start working for you so that you don't have to work as hard. So you want to get as far to the left as possible on this graph. <clears throat> now, how much should you invest? So guys, this is only my opinion but you should only invest the money you can afford to lose. And as I was saying earlier, try not to invest in something that's gonna lose you a lot of money. Always look at, you know, always do your due dil diligence, research the stock, understand why you're buying it. And, you know, work on increase, and, you know, you might be better off working on increasing your income. You know, the rich get richer. Sometimes it might not be the best idea to invest in stocks. You want to find out ways like do side hustles or learn new skills, go back to school and just get a higher paying job so you can earn more money so you can invest more. And then if you're young and you have excess cash, you can open up a, a brokerage account after watching this video. Invest to get the ball rolling. However, like I said, it's probably better to invest in things that have a hard higher ROI, like self-improvement, building a business, education, but just get over that initial hump of starting to invest and then set a monthly goal of how much money to invest based on your income. Like I said, I do 125 every single week. Every Monday, I put that in my account and I buy stocks. And then every once in a while, I put extra money in. And then guys, you want to prioritize index funds. So due diligence, this is the Securities Act of 1933, made brokerages disclose specific info about securities before they could be sold to the public. And while this made investing safer, you must do your own research <clears throat> before investing in a stock. You guys, research at least one hour. And then, like I said, think about who uses the products and services that your stock produces and why. And then different stocks work for different people. There's, it's based on risk reward, your timeline, and your opinions about the company and the industry. And next up is fundamental analysis versus technical analysis. <clears throat> so guys, these are actionable steps that you can take now. You can open up a stock brokerage account and get free stocks. Use my links below to support the channel. You know, fund your account. Do your due diligence. Do your research. 
And then guys, buy your first stock or buy the S&P 500 or the total stock market index. And guys, just continue learning about the stock market. And I'm gonna be putting out videos weekly about my stock portfolio updates. I'm gonna start doing that on Sundays with M1 Finance. So you guys can see how my portfolio performs, the good, the bad, the ugly, the ups and downs. I'll show you guys full transparency on what I'm buying, what I'm selling if I do, and there's no paywall. It'll all be free content for you. <clears throat> and so yeah, so guys, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video because it'll really help me out. Comment, and guys, I will respond to all your comments. And if you want to see more investing content, go ahead and subscribe. And then, you know, in the future, in a year or two, you can say like, hey, I was an OG subscriber. So yeah, guys, smash that like button. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you guys next time.